Greg Powell, host of Forest and Fire. Kyle Mann. I'm Jay Warner Wallace. Kira Davis. It's Ben Adams. Hey, this is Dave Baker. Harry Pomeroli. This is Mike Reiner. Oh, this is Ethan Nicole. This is Liam Morgan. This is Graham Parker of the Fifth GP. And this is why you should never, 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 never. How I got suckered in. I'm so embarrassed that I'm here. You're wasting your time. You got better things to do. Never listen. Those darling, yummy. Reverend and the Reprobate. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Reverend and the Reprobate. My name is Lucas Pinkert. I'm an actual pastor in Lake Dallas, Texas. And with me, as always, as, mm-hmm, is, a, is a man whose mom would not be caught dead in a gang of pirates, even though she's currently incarcerated and about to get out on leave for Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. But she does like limes. It's it's Big Dan, yeah. the Whip, yeah. Whip Gibson. What's happening, buddy? What's going on, pumpkin? Oh, just uh, living the dream. Yeah? Living life. Staying alive, baby. The, the last time we checked in with you uh, on last week's episode, you said that you live in a constant state of self-destruction. <laughs> Is that, uh, do we have I, an update on that? Uh, no, I actually, I think I stole that from you from a long time ago. Oh, yeah, ago. probably so. Uh, this is when we, we, were, we were just youngins, and you uh-huh. said that, and I went, save. Yep. That, that's a good line. Yeah, constant state of self-destruction, and that I always try to work everything out so everybody gets what I want. That's, uh, that, <laughs> that's my favorite one. <laughs> Everyone gets what I want, and yeah. I'm happy. And then, and then we'll all be happy. Um, today on our Ooh. show, oh God, something that's good. Gosh, yeah, go for it. God of War Ragnarok. Is it? Uh, yeah. What What are you doing? I'm asking you a question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I know you were meant on the you, last one. But yeah, you made me play the this last one. This is a ten one. out of ten on IGN. Okay, I think it's four point nine out of five on something else. Meta, How's Metacritic? Yeah, what's Nintendo Power think of it? They They think. It's 1990, and Mario's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> what do they think of Clay Fighters 63 and a oh, third? Oh, they love that one. Yeah, they love, that was a big hit. So uh, today on our show, we have got Captain Ren C. Thomas. Now, uh, Captain Thomas was... Um, running an oil rig off the coast of Nigeria when his boat was attacked by pirates, mm-hmm. and him and his chief engineer were... Hilo. ...taken hostage... By pirates. Yep. For 18 days. It's one of... Uh, now, we've read the book, his book, Pirate Hostage. We've had the opportunity to read it. Uh, we're joined today also with um, his co-author. And it's one of the craziest stories I've ever heard. Um, we've gotten to do... Uh, and an, we just scratched the surface. Yeah, we still. just really get to scratch the surface. We talked to him about what it's like to have been captured by pirates, um, what it was like processing all of that, the things his family went through, um, what it's like to, to come home after having somebody pay $3 million in ransom money to get you and, back. And also the cast of characters in, in the on the... In the pirate, yeah. So, pirate so what? What names it, do we it, have? We it, have. It feels. It feels like a horribly demented Disney movie. Yeah, because they're not just you know. Oh, there's six guys all armed and being mean. No, they're all vicious, characters, and they're all characters. Yeah, it's it's like um, I'm I'm trying to think. Somebody, I was I was listening to somebody try to describe the book, and they essentially said that what it sounds like is all the kids from the Sandlot were given AK forty sevens and yeah. just never grew up. Like this really yeah. is very akin to the uh, the the whole Neverland ideas. Yep, is that from a young age these. Young men were trained to be pirates. In fact, they're indoctrinating he, he talks, a young a young man in the book. Yeah, d- during during his time there, and and Captain Ren talks to us about how they think that what they're doing literally is good work. Mm-hmm. They see no problem with it as all at all. They've got uh, one of the guys named Story, who's a pirate with a peg leg, is talking to to Captain Ren about. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego at gunpoint. It's at gun, yeah, it's the most bizarre interview we've we've done in forever. And there's one excerpt, and I'm like, I'm not gonna have you read the excerpt, but we do talk about it. Um, give us kind of the the quick, high level version of the story that you found most interesting and kind of disgusting. That sort of gives us the it it kind of sets the tone for the guys that had him is the monkey yeah 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 i mean he he talks about not being able to eat and drink they had some bottle of water but right. that, but there's a trapper or a hunter that comes in with monkeys that he's killed in the jungle days ago and they kind of rinse them off but they're covered in flies and they just they eat it up and they offer it to him and he says you know, like no like in, like he, i'll in, die in, yeah in the book he says there's no hospital nearby like i'm not 
built for this. I can't eat that. Yeah, it's and rats too, and it's just and, and they all eat it out of one bowl on the ground. Do it's it's a harrowing story. Yeah, um, they actually do have a, a pirate cove that's built. It's one of um, just the most incredible books that I've that I've ever read. I will tell you, it's not for the faint of heart. Mm-hmm. Um, Let's let's make no bones about it. Even though Captain Thomas is a believer, he's also a sailor, and um, the way that him and Lori tell these stories, they make sure that you know exactly what's going on and, and when it's happening. So it's it's incredible. It's maybe one of we, we were talking probably top three and most incredible stories we've ever gotten to to share. We've got Ross Ulbrich. We've 100%. got. Um, the story of David, David Gant. Gant. Yeah, uh, the one of the largest bank robbers in U.S. history and the man who was captured by pirates, Captain Ren C. Thomas. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure that you like, subscribe, ding the little bell to get notifications as we are still continuing in our Reverend and Reprobate 100 Days of the Reverend Rep as we celebrate 100 interview episodes. And without any further ado... Captain Thomas. Keep going. Uh, on our sweet, clean airways today... Yeah. Whip. <laughs> We've got um, one. This has been just a completely fascinating story mm-hmm. that I've become enraptured with, and that is the story of Captain Wren Thomas. Uh, when Captain you, when Thomas, you told me about it, it turned my whole day around. Yeah, it did. It did. We I got. Mean, it's a. It's a story. So it's we, a serious story. We but. get this email that says, "Hey, um, we we have somebody that we think you might want to interview. They survived being captured by pirates." Is that something you think would fit on your show? And we're like, who cares? <laughs> we we absolutely have to talk to this well, guy. Well, also check. Yeah, yeah, check. Yeah, absolutely, it fits on our show. But um, after reading his book, he has become one of those people that's been thrown into the upper echelon for me of just uh, modern day heroes. It is Captain Ren Thomas, uh, who wrote the book Pirate Hostage, along with his editor Lori Van Gilder Pruce. Preuss. Preuss. Promoting the, the choice the book. is Price. Price. Yep. Uh, they're here with us today. What's going on, y'all? Not much. Just chilling. Hi there. Hey. Okay. So I want to just kind of hop right in to things. So after reading the book, we find out, you know, Captain Thomas is. Yeah. If you had to give a two minute spiel, what what is it? Yeah. You yeah. Know, yeah. How the, would, how would you describe summary? it? Let's... If it was being made in a movie and there's an IMDb. Uh, description. What is it? Yeah, what's the high level? Well, uh, three o'clock in the morning, I got a knock on my bedroom door s- saying that uh, we was getting boarded. And we all went down to the tank room behind the engine room and stayed there for six hours until the pirates got their guns in a hole. They grinded in the door with a, a mini grinder and fired shots in there. And we pretty much, I decided along with my engineer to go ahead and give up before anybody got hurt. I survived it. I'm still surviving it. I had my dog Bo to help me out. Quit drinking. My uh, psychiatrist got me on the right medications, so I'm doing pretty good right now. Your engineer in the book, you you give him a, a nickname of of high low, which I think might actually be appropriate for us too, because you're a you're a tall guy and he's a short one. And um, I actually sit with my chair all the way up so that I can look Danley in the eyes whenever we do these <laughs> do these interviews. So that that might may that may need to be the new uh, the new name of our sub shows is the high lows. But um, you and him make this really bold decision. You get boarded. Uh, you're out on um, this this run on your, I guess you're, you're doing offshore oil stuff. And one of the things that you say in the book is that you had a a radioactive element with you. You were carrying something that at this point, not only takes you from a high value target because you've got crude oil from the area, but now you have something that sort of every, especially third world nation wants to get their hands on because it's an incredibly valuable when you're going on this run, um, what, I guess, what kind of gut feeling do you have going on it? Did you think you were going to get boarded? Did you think you were high risk or had a target on you whenever you started this particular um, mission, I guess? Yes, and actually I had that feeling before I even left home to go to work. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was a sixth sense I had. I, I just knew something was going to happen. 
And then when we was when I was back at work, we got a letter in the mail saying that uh, that they was going to board one of our boats and burn it down and kidnap the crew. So whoa! But yeah, I knew it before I even left home that I was going to get kidnapped. Wow. So were threats what? like that, was that pretty commonplace working, you know, offshore in Nigeria? Or is that something that kind of you think was specifically targeted towards you? Because you'd, you kind of make out in the book that you begin to have this reputation as a captain that's not going to take very much nonsense because of the job that you guys are doing, the safety regulations, and the fact that, you know, being a former Marine, y'all are flying under the American flag and that means something to you. I think it was targeted towards me. They so, said they knew they knew everything about what we was going to be doing that night because of the radio transmissions with okay. the doc. So, yeah, it was definitely targeted towards us. Uh, so, so Lori, so you, you have taken this story and have kind of co- helped compile it right into a, into a, a full, a full, um, full length novel. Book. Yeah. Yeah. B- book. What, what makes a novel and a book different? Um, whether or not it's got elves. Oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's whether or not it's a true story. A novel is is fiction, and book, Ren's book is nonfiction, so it's a st- book or a story. Oh, okay. So, as you're compiling this story, what was what was that challenge like? Um, when it, when I was first approached with the with project, I was like, sure, that sounds interesting. And then the more I dug into it the more humbled I was that Ren was sharing all this and that I could have the opportunity to help him share his world story with the world, because that's still the most dangerous shipping highway in the world is outside Nigeria and the Gulf of Guinea. And it's number one target for ships. Do you, do you think we always think of Somalia because of the movie Captain Phillips? You know, I always, I always think that's the, that's the number one having no real information on it. Yeah, I, I think all of us did really think of Somalia at first, and then you start realizing that there was an international task force put together after the worldwide notice because of Captain Phillips, and they s- took care of that coast, okay. but all the danger switched to the other coast of Africa over by Nigeria where Captain Thomas was kidnapped. Wow. So I'm I'm completely fascinated with stories of survivors. Because I think that there's not only something that's inspirational about being a survivor of some kind of tragic event or, um, you know, we've, we've talked to folks that have survived 9-11. We've talked to survivors of human trafficking and listening to the way that those stories shape a person's life um, is is absolutely incredible to me. And I'm curious as we, you know, kind of dive into, you know, what what all happened during um during this captivity, um, I want to know, Lori, what what are the elements that really stood out to you? Like when you're pitched this story about a guy who um, is, is, like I said, a, a modern day day hero. When you're pitched this Absolutely. story, what elements of the the survivor aspect stand out to you as a as an author? I was really intrigued at how he was making sure that himself and his co- and chief engineer Hilo were taken care of and making sure that they captured rainwater, that they were taking medicines. He was obviously very quick thinking on the boat and said, hey, you know, let me be decent to the man in charge of the pirates so that he could go get a few things to help the two of them survive their captivity, which was important. Their sister ship had been taken hostage previously, so they expected to be gone for 14 days at least. So he took medicines and necessities with him which was very well thought, well planned, I think. And then he just continued to make sure that they were taken care of and not eating nasty food that nobody wanted to eat. So he, he had a, a lot of good survivor instinct right there from the start. And, and Seymour was his name, right? The or, or at least the nickname that you guys had given, you and Hilo had given to, it sounds like most of the captors, but Seymour was the, was the lead, was the leader, right? Right. Well, how 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 did you befriend him, or not necessarily befriend, but how did you kind of de-escalate? Because that that's a great point that if you know you're being taken captive, there are some survival items that you might want to plan. plan I just out kept for. talking to him, and I told him, you know, I said, if you want me to stay alive, we got to have these uh, these medications. I had uh, an inhaler I had to get. I had uh, our uh, 
virus medication the doxy, I had to get. The doxycycline. Doxycycline, yeah, for malaria. And then I, I brought some uh, vitamin C Hall's medication with us so we'd have our vitamin C. So this is one of the things about the high C's that always, like, it rolls in my head is that the the need of vitamin C on a ship is yeah. still very, very, very real. That that's something like when when we think of like, okay, these are the things that happened back in, you know, the 1400s, or the 1500s. There was, why, there was scurvy because of, yeah, yeah, because of lack of vitamin C. That's why the British were called limeys because they would eat limes all the time in order to keep their vitamin C up. But those are the things even to this day that you guys have to find through some sort of supplemental way um, whenever you're out there because – you know, scurvy and those kind of things are are still a legitimate threat, right? Even today, that's so bizarre. It, it almost seems like you guys are are living in a different time period, especially when we hear a story <laughs> like this. Yeah, it is interesting it is. that so far there's a there's an interview you know, that we're doing about a pirate capture, and we've already talked about scurvy <laughs> in modern day modern yeah. day times. <laughs> so so you and Hilo end up um, you end up giving yourselves up. Because, as you explain in the book, that an American hostage is worth more to them than uh, the the ABs or the shipment that you had that were uh, from Nigeria that were helping you guys out on on this. They they often they would take things from it, and then as you're on your way to this sort of pirate cove that they've built, right? That you guys are are watching. You and Hilo are watching them rob other ships on the way there. That they're using these other ships as as kind of as tugboats. Can you talk to us a little bit about like what that experience was like and and what they were doing in order to make it to the cove? Well, it was crazy. The first, uh, they were all shrimp boats, three of them. And the very first one, they boarded the shrimp boat and uh, they beat up the crew and took what they could and got the captain to tow us. I guess we was so far out that they didn't have enough fuel to get back into the uh, pirate's cove. So, we just went from one shrimp boat to an, to the next, robbing them of uh, payoffs and uh, and shrimp and whatever else they could grab from them. As as you're watching all of this happen, is there any point in time where and and I don't know what uh, the only thing I know about maritime law is that it was a running joke on Arrested Development and all of our our commenters who are sovereign citizens, yeah. you know, refer to it right. So it's just it's kind of. Any anything I know about it at best is is some sort of sarcastic, you know, remark or, or joke that has to do it. But there there have been the questions and some of our, our followers on on Facebook and our Facebook group are asking, you know, why weren't you guys armed, especially since you're a you're a trained Marine, you know, and first, why weren't you armed? And and second, um, how many folks did it take to uh to take over a, a ship y'all's size? Um, and, and how many guys were, were there on the boat that took you to the cove? Well, number one, we're not allowed to have, uh, you're not allowed to have any guns in Nigeria in their, in their waters. So we couldn't carry any weapons and it's not usual for, uh, boats to carry weapons. What they're doing in Somalia and other places is they're hiring like, uh, retired green berets or Navy seals to uh, guard their ships. But. Nigeria wouldn't allow that. So, oh, wow. so private security is not allowed. No, hmm. no. Since you weren't armed, how many of the the pirates did it take to um, to take you guys hostage and and all these other ships, these three other shrimp boats? Like we, when we think of pirate boardings, I think oftentimes people still have this idea that it is um, in the Disney style. You know, that you've got a raising of the Jolly Roger. Yeah. And and there's a ship that's got, you know, 60 people on it and a crocodile with a clock in its belly and that they're jumping over, you know, Uh all that kind of stuff in order to make it happen. But this doesn't seem like that was the case at all, that they use just pure force and intimidation. No, there was there was six of them on their boat that attacked us with guns. They each had a gun. So it didn't take much. And I think a part of my crew was a part of it. Hmm of us uh you know getting captured so you had some insiders didn't help at all yeah okay so you you make it to this this pirate cove you get tugged there by shrimp boats that are being robbed 
you know, along the way. And it's obvious that the even the Nigerian people have kind of just succumbed to like, this is what's going to happen. Periodically, we're going to get robbed. We're going to have, you know, to, to pay things out. And they've almost like capitulated that this is part of their lives now. And you guys make it to the Pirate Cove and now they've got to determine you know, what it is that they do with y'all. Do they ask for ransom? Um, you know, do they ask for the company? Do they ask from your families? Uh, what do they have to do to keep you alive? What part of that conversation, you know, were, were you able to um, interject into? Because you do a lot of mediating for yourself in Hilo throughout the course of, of your, your couple of weeks in captivity. So talk to us a little bit about that. For the first five days, nobody was contacted. So nobody knew if we was alive or dead. And then uh, finally on the sixth day, we got to talk to our office over there. And then that's when the negotiations started. Lori, there are several times in the book where we get these sort of periscopes of, you know, what happened from their perspective of um of the captain's wife or the captain's mom or his son um how how were those things done did you go and did you interview them in order to get you know that uh, that content and then you know write in their voice or um are these things that like maybe they had in their journals or they they wrote letters into you how did you compile that information and, and what was that like most of that information came to me in written form okay um, the publisher had worked with them for a while prior to my joining the project, and they sent in letters or they wrote their story. I believe that um, Ren's wife, Rhonda, Captain Thomas's wife, Rhonda, I believe she might have had a journal because her notes were just amazing as to what happened on which day, although I'm sure she was terrified. Maybe it's just burned into her memory. How yeah, long- there's a lot of almost yeah. journal-like entries, or there are journal entries in the in the book. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, that, I'm, that was nice to have it it gave a lot of context to the other side of the story right because there is there's a point at which you're just completely taken with what happens to to captain thomas and um you you say in the book that um you know a lot of your your friends and family call you tommy and um that was my granddad's name so as soon as i read that i was like oh this is awesome like this this kind of feels like (laughs) home like i got this connection with with this guy and so as we're as I'm, I'm reading and I'm getting totally engrossed in your story. And then there was this, this hop away to like, this is what's happening at home. How long after your, your point of capture does your family find out that something is going on? They knew probably, I didn't ever ask, but they probably knew that day. Really? Same day it happened. Yeah. And, and like you said, they didn't, they didn't know if you were alive or, you know, what, right. what For the, the first five was. days, they didn't know if we was alive or dead. And there were some issues, uh, you said, with the because you you made a very 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 strong point of hey look we're gonna do our you know boarding protocols if we get boarded this is what we do and you ran a safety drill with everybody beforehand you mentioned that you kind of had in your gut even before you left home that something might happen on this particular run you you do that you go through that whole process and yet at three a.m. when you get boarded nobody thinks to hit the alarms. I know you said that your alarm um, had been, you know, dysfunctional for a while and that the ships were often in, in disrepair, even the the ones that were fairly new. And then your, uh, your guys that were on the deck in the bridge didn't hit the alarms at all. Is that something that you think was part of, of the plan behind the scenes, if you can speculate? Or do you think those were just things that, that happened to now add to this, um, you know, five day period where people are are growing more and more concerned about whether or not you guys survived. No, it was actually a part of the scene. Uh, my uh, my security manager found that the uh, the cords, the main power cord to the uh, to the buttons, was uh, cut in half. So somebody on the crew had to have done it. They really? had to have cut it in half. So it wouldn't have worked anyway. Wow. Yeah. So what is, I guess in, in retrospect, as you're looking back at this and this happened in, uh, in 2013, right? So we're nine years removed from the event though, as, like I said, as we've talked to survivors nine years removed, it still seems like yesterday or it still seems like minutes ago, oftentimes, 
you know, when you've been through a, a traumatic situation like that, the further removed you get from it, are you, do you feel like you're gaining clarity on some of those things? Or are you saying, you know what, I know now that, that this was um, a setup? Or do you feel like you're leaning more towards the acceptance of, you know, whether it was or not, uh, we just got to find a way to to keep moving forward? Right. I've, I, I know that it was a setup, but now I am. I'm doing better. Of course, Bo passed away, my dog, my beloved service dog. He passed away, but, you know, I quit. Like I said, I quit drinking. My medications are straight, and I'm just living day by day now, you know. I think about it every now and then, but my therapists, they pretty much got me to try to forget it. Do you think that writing the book and telling your story, do you find that it it's therapeutic or does it tend to like drum stuff up? And because there seems to be two two sides of the story that survivors either find their they're telling the story therapeutic or that it takes a, you know, we can I could trauma. tell the story once. Right. But now we've got to schedule the next interview or the next whatever, 24 to 48 hours later, because you've got to kind of recover from you know, reliving that trauma, what side of that line do you tend to fall on? I kind of fall in the middle. Sometimes it bothers me. Sometimes it don't. Is there a, a specific um, thing? And I don't, like I said, we don't want to, you know, try and trigger any memories or anything, but is there a specific thing that you find makes it lean one way or the other, like talking about certain events or um, is it just, you know, kind of just depends on how things hit you at that time? It just depends on how things hit me at the time. How is it hitting you now? I'm okay. We always just want to I check in. Funny, I got two funny guys to talk to, so I'm good. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> that's good to hear. Yes. S- speaking of, of funny guys, uh, there's oh, a man. character that you talk we're, about, and, and I'll let you take no, it because I know we're on the same page here, and I know this. these page. are the questions you wanted to ask, so you go for this. Yeah, so getting getting to the first camp. So we've gotten into the Cove Um the the book and Laura, you do a great job of kind of capturing these char- these characters. I mean, they're real life people, but uh, thank you. Yeah, all of all of there's 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 Bubba, named after for the Forrest Gump because he looks like Bubba. Uh, I do like that it says ugly. He was uglier than a fence post type of ugly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, there is there is a there is a pirate with a sort of peg leg. He's got a pros- prosthetic leg, but mm-hmm. it is interesting. It's kind of a modern day take of a pirate, right? It's a modern day yeah. pirate with a modern day peg leg. Yes. Um, and then preacher, who who I think was was interesting, and story time, story uh, time. Uh, I would love to hear more about him because he. Uh, I mean, this sentence: story time was a crazy man. I think <laughs> I think is a pretty he loaded. was very crazy. He- and he always had a story to tell us about something. He'd repeat it stories or whatever, but he was always talking, always telling us stories about Nigeria. And he was just, he was insane. <laughs> and, and, and also Bible stories. Right. He tried to tell us some Bible stories. So you, you do talk about how your faith helped to get you through this. Is it weird hearing one of your captors talk to you about Bible stories whenever you're trying to reconcile, like escaping this with your own faith? Right. They didn't believe they were sinners. So yeah, it was kind of crazy. My, uh, my cook, he was, a, he was probably a slave or a, mm-hmm. he had a Bible with him and I, he let me read it by myself. So, but yeah, they, they always do that. They, they're heavy sinners and they, they don't believe they are. They believe it's the Bible. Yeah, that is interesting that he's telling so he's crazy. telling Bible studies while pointing an M60 at you. Yeah, so right. I, I wonder if you would have more success preaching with yeah. if you hadn't held people at <laughs> gunpoint. Yeah. My altar calls would be better if there was if I was literally like <laughs> <laughs> mandatory attendance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, we'd have one really high. It seems like our attendance fluctuates. It's either yeah. really high or really low. There's really no in, mm-hmm. in but between. But when it's high, everyone's there. Everyone, everyone is there. Um, I, I know I'm making light of this a little bit, but that that was these are fascinating characters. It, that that it's so cause, wild. Because when yeah. I think of pirates, even modern day pirates, I think of you know really, I mean they are bad men, but kind of boring bad men. These these men do not come across as boring. They all seem relatively interesting. And and it seems weird to me. Like I would. I would have a hard time listening to somebody who had taken me captive 
tell me Bible stories. Yeah. Like, I don't want to hear about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the guy that's got a, a gun pointed at me. Believe it. It just seems like you, dude, you've totally missed it. So how do you keep from when you're in that situation? Like, how do you keep from having these kind of conversations with the pirates where you're like, <laughs> hey, dude, uh, you actually like completely missed the point of that story. Yeah, I, I need a shower and some food and water. <laughs> not a... Right. That's yeah. that's it. You know, I need I need good food, good water. We had bottled water. They bought us bottled water until the very end when we ran out. But that's, that's whole... we need good food. You know, we weren't going to eat their fish or their shrimp or anything like that because come from polluted waters and we didn't want to get even sicker than what we already were. So as we kind of fast forward, you you're in captivity for just a little over two weeks. How do you eventually, you know, get home? What's that look like? Before we left Nigeria, we talked to the FBI at, uh, at the American embassy and then, uh, went to the airport and flew home. But, it was an exciting time. Was there a ransom that they put up for you guys? Yeah, I'd heard it was $3 million. Wow. Like $3 million U.S. dollars or $3 million in the Nigerian currency? $3 million U.S. dollars. Good grief. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, the, and, and, yeah, and in the book, you, you talk about that, that they had told you if anyone came to rescue you, that you would be of no use to them, right? And they would, they would go and end, end you. Wow. Right, they told us if uh, anybody came to rescue us, they'd kill us. So that was pretty scary because anytime they heard a crazy noise, they'd inject around into their weapons and all go crazy. So it that was kind of scary, no doubt. Yeah. So, Lori, as you're hearing all of this, and you know you're tasked with taking all of the details from this story, putting them into not just chronological order, but but in taking all the details from all the other research and things that you've done, now you've got to put it in a way that meshes everything that's going on back home with the family, everything that's going on back home with law enforcement, with you know the things from Captain Thomas's story of where he's at. What as you're you know getting all of that information, as you're writing all of this out, how difficult was it to keep the the timeline together, and what is what are those last? you know, 48 hours of, of captivity look like whenever you're, you're trying to write the story? Well, in my opinion, the last 48 hours, not after captivity necessarily, but even the ransom turnover mm -hmm. was very sketchy yeah. and very tension filled. And then they're running down these dark alleys in between buildings and they couldn't get them out of the city that they were in because they were the wrong nationality to be out at that time of night. Right. And they had to have like a local tribal chief negotiate on behalf of the people that were paying the ransom. So that, that added an extra little bit to it as well. Long before the net, you know, it comes sunlight, they could go over to their old port where they should have been bringing the ship home back to right. and see their teams. And then they were off to see the FBI. And it's just amazing how it must've been a whirlwind for them to go from, you know, ramen noodles every other day and that's it to these big meals that everybody wants to keep feeding them. And Hey, here's your coffee. <laughs> that, that coffee tasted good, Ren. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did. You know, we, we kind of see that same sort of thing play out in the movie Castaway, And that was, as I'm, I'm reading kind of the end of your story, that's what I'm, you know, if, if I'm like trying to place it, like, what does this feel like? Is it sort of looks like the end of that movie where Tom Hanks gets brought home and everybody wants to throw these big extravagant meals and parties for him and he can eat like, you know, two or three bites of something. And then, you know, he really wants steak and he has steak, but it's steak is it's too savory for him. And, and he kind of has lost his taste for so many things because of how long he's been gone and what he experienced. That's often the case when we look at somebody who it happens with prisoners too, where sometimes it, they want to sleep yeah. in a closet or something because yeah, they're used and to a it. lot of, you know, a lot of times it happens from our soldiers overseas <laughs> who, you know, the first night in their bed, they can't get any rest at all because they've been sleeping on, on cots or, you know, on, on the ground. Um, you do talk in your book a lot, how, uh, towards the end of things and, and part of your story up until now is dealing with the post-traumatic stress from all of this. You know, what is, 
what has the process been over the last several years in trying to, as you know, we're, we're just, I think we just passed the nine year anniversary of you coming home. You know, what has the process been in getting um, back to where, you know, you're not constantly having to, to look over your shoulder and you're able to overcome that fear? Well, Bo did a lot of that for me. And, and Bo, for for our uh, our listeners, is uh, the service dog that you had from 2015 to uh, 2019, who um, passed away from cancer, and we're we're very sorry to to hear about that. But he was a big part of of your recovery after you got home. Right, he was. I got him in uh, 2015, and I had to put him to sleep in 2020. Mm. But he trained me as much as I trained him. So that was a big part of it. I know that there is, um, sort of this stigma right now with emotional support animals in particular, because there are, there are things like you see college students now that are getting online certifications for their rescue puppy to become an emotional support animal so that they can keep it in their dorm room. Right. Um, right. You and Bo had a legitimate uh, emotional support and relationship. How does that work between you and the dog? Like, what did that look like day to day when it's not being abused, when it is actually, you know, that you need this dog there in order to help you you make it through? What was y'all's relationship like? We was very close. He, uh, he protected me in uh, many good ways. It was... We done everything legal through Tackett Service Dogs in California. Yeah, and he was very well trained, and he helped me out a lot. Like when I was, like when I was having nightmares, he'd wake me up, and when we'd go out in public, he'd watch for me. Have you thought about about getting another one? Yeah, but I don't know if I want to get one or not. Yeah, because there's, there's still a lot of care. Yeah, a lot, it's a commitment. It's a what a. 10 year at least commitment. Yeah. Well, and you know, we, so my family trains hunting dogs and, uh, we had a, a German short hair pointer and, and many of our listeners know this, that the, my, my son had been in the NICU for, um, like 50 something days. We just brought him home about four weeks ago. And just a couple of days after we brought him home, this, um, who was our, our main sire of our kennel, he'd been my bird hunting dog for years and years, like just a really rapid deterioration happened. And, you know, we take him to the vet one day and the next day we find out he's got a, you know, a cancer about the size of a baseball in his lung and we've got to put him down. And so you have this, you know, people have this emotional connection that they have with their animals for one reason or another. And, you know, for me and Uller, he went everywhere with me, but he was not, you know, if, if I was having a nightmare, he wasn't waking me up. Like he wasn't right. looking, you know, he wasn't looking out for me. His job was to go and to find birds. And so he was constantly trying to get away from me so that he could, you know, show me, <laughs> show me something else. When, when you say that Bo looked out for you when you guys were out in public, what was, what did that look like? Was he trying to keep you away from crowds? Was he, um, you know, trained to look at specific things or to use, you know, dogs kind of have these six senses to, was he looking out for somebody that may have been aggressive or something like that and trying to steer you away from them so that it, you know, it wouldn't kind of trigger your PTSD. What did, what was that training like? And what did that look like? Well, he was a Rottweiler, so most of the time people would just stay away from me, period. Yeah, Some no people doubt. would want to come up and pet him and do all that. But I think he was more just being a Rottweiler. Just having that, that protective presence around you gave you security in those situations? Right. It gave me peace. And, I, you know, like if I was using a ATM machine or something like that, he'd face – behind me that way he could see if anybody was coming or if I wanted him like if I was sitting in a chair or in a restaurant he'd lay down or sit down by my feet and, and block people from coming so he done a lot of things for me as far as things like that goes that's awesome R Rottweilers are kind of notorious for their 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 happy growls <laughs> did, did he yeah. that, you know, you'd pet him or uh, comb, comb. I've seen a lot of videos where, you know, brushing them out and they start snarling, but it's a happy. Did he do some of that? No, he never did that. He didn't. He was always really good about everything. That's awesome. Yeah. He, uh, 
there towards the end, he had to start getting muzzled to get his nails clipped. But Ooh. he he never I could brush him all day long, and he'd never snarl or nothing like that at me. Mm-hmm. He was always really good to me. You he was a happy dog. You mention um, in in the final chapters that up until 2019 that you still had trouble, you know, being around or, or even in bed with your wife because of the night terrors and that you were afraid that there, there might be, um, you know, an incident where you, where you wake up in the middle of something, and especially now that Bo's gone, where you weren't going to be able to control, you know, how how you were acting or reacting. Has has that changed? Have you gotten better you you know how are things on that front uh it's still the same she lives in her house i live in my house but we're still close how have you've got two sons and you've got a a little stepdaughter how has your relationship with them changed since you've you've been back it's always been good that's awesome yeah i know one of your sons um has written several parts in the book, you know, he, yeah. yeah, he talks about you, I believe at one point he describes you as, as Superman, which as yeah. a, as a new dad, um, that's, that's what I want. Uh, I want my, my kid to think of me in that way. Um, how do you think sharing your story is going to affect the legacy that you leave for, for your kids? I think it's going to give them more insight on exactly what happened. And they're proud of me that I did it. They're scared to read the book, but right. they're going to. Yeah, it, it, but, is, it is intense. I mean, there's there's stories in here of the captors hurting other people in the camp. You know, there was uh, yeah. cutting with machetes and... Uh, Slapping them on the backs with machetes. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely that's a serious. It's not for the faint of heart. Yeah. That's, that's I mean, for some, sure. Some of the illnesses going on. And one of them was uh, one of the captors bringing home hunts of dead monkeys that, you know, that have been out for a day and Ugh. rinsing them yeah. in the river and eating them on the floor. <laughs> and it sounds, it sounds horrifying. That, that does not sound like the Michelin rated dumpling restaurants that we're used to. <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 Lord, I've, I've, <laughs> no, it doesn't precious. <laughs> I've got to yeah, it's not how you eat monkeys. Yeah, eats them with a, some taters. So, so Lori, as you're putting this story together, um, as as delicate as it, as it is to handle some of the things that go into the uh, the telling of a story like this, right? Mm-hmm. How do you balance out the gruesome nature of the stuff that that Danley was talking about? With the very, you know, real emotional nature of the stuff that um, that Captain Thomas and, and Hilo are going through, and then the things, you know, back home as you're telling um, the story of the, of the family that's that's wanting to see Dad. How do you balance out kind of the gory and gruesome nature of what's going on with being able to tell a, a story that's both very emotionally gripping and, and captivating? Um. Kind of a funny thing. I worked in nine one one for about thirty five years. Okay, I knew so I talked to you before. <laughs> nothing shocks me. Um, so that was probably a good thing. Um, I'm I'm known for not having normal stories, so I balanced some of that in with this, where you know Captain Thomas was going through truly horrible stuff, and yet his wife was suffering, and his kids were worrying. You know, and at one point Dylan said. Why would I sleep? I'm sure my dad's not sleeping. You know, so the emotional component to that was very, I think, necessary to the story. And I also think that the story needed to come out because there was no fanfare when Captain Thomas came home. There was nothing. There was no media. There were no welcome home parades. There was no big crowds greeting him back. And I think that circumstances that surrounded his homecoming, and I'll just say it like that, weren't fair to him or his family because of what they had been through yeah. and what they were denied. And that, that recognition that they had overcome himself and Hilo, such amazing obstacles. And yet they were denied that chance to be looked at. And as you said earlier, you know, this afternoon, and he's a hero. He deserves that recognition. I, absolutely. And I'm, I'm so curious, um, you know, now why there wasn't, you know, that kind of 
of recognition, especially during that point in time. And uh, it seems, you know, we can speculate as to, to what those reasons were, but I am very happy now that he's getting the opportunity to, to tell a story. I want to thank you guys for coming on the show. Um, we've got one last segment, a way that we end all of our interviews with, and it's a little segment we called Controlled Rowdiness. <laughs> So we're going to ask you guys some rapid fire questions. They're all going to be lighthearted. You can answer them with as long or as short an answer as you want to. Uh, Don't expect anything from us by way of reply or response. And to get us started on some of those, uh, I'm going to send it over to General Grease. All right. Well, I'm going to start with Lori. Uh, Lori, aliens have arrived. Oh, I love this one. And they have asked, they have dared demanding a 911 story within 60 seconds so good that they will not destroy the earth. And clean or not go. clean? Um, Rel- relatively clean. <laughs> relatively clean. Uh, that's going to take some more work. Uh, <laughs> I imagine. You're, really you're welcome. Good. I'm so twisted. I'm sorry. Um, really good 911 story that they're not going to destroy the earth. Probably the guy who thought that he called 911 and said there was a bunch of robots out in the back of his house and they had laid weapons out in a circle around a tree and it turned out there was him standing with his back to the tree, and he really had surrounded himself with weapons. Whoa. That became an interesting night. Where'd the robots go? <laughs> yeah, that's what we wondered. The the aliens took the robots back. Yeah. That's that's what happened. Um, <laughs> Captain Thomas, you say in the book that, uh, you know, as the pirates gave a bunch of people nicknames, they referred to you as Stone Cold Steve Austin. If you could be any other wrestler in the WWE, WCW, NWO, who else would you have wanted to be compared to if not Stone Cold? The Rock. I could see it. I, I could smell what Captain Ren yeah, is cooking. I can too. I can see that. <laughs> I'll write The Rock's book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lori, what mm-hmm. is the best slash worst purchase you've ever made? This is a terrible question. It's, it's a rough the one. Best slash yeah. worst purchase. Yeah. Hmm. What's the best worst thing you've ever bought? Best worst. Or, thing or what's your most useless talent? A vacuum. A oh, vacuum? Okay. Because <laughs> yeah. once you get it, you got to use it. That's true. That's true. Unless you get a robot one. Well, it's a great vacuum, but it sucks. But I'm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was good. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Captain Ren. So you've you've had this incredible story that you've uh, gotten to tell. You uh, you told us a lot during this interview about all the time that you've spent on ships. Um, once and for all, does the toilet paper on the boat, does the roll go over or under? Over. Over. All right. Captain's Definitely orders. What, what about at home? Over. Same. See, yeah. Captain's orders. The roll goes over. So take note, Mrs. Pinkard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Captain Wren, what is your favorite ocean? The Caribbean. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's if, a good if, one. If, if you had to choose a permanent vacation home of a active volcano or the Mariana Trench, which one would you choose? <laughs> active volcano. <laughs> <laughs> really? Why? Excitement. Okay, no. yeah. That's you Because you haven't had enough of that in your life in the, yeah. <laughs> the <Right>. past <laughs> several years. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Lori, last question is going to be for you. Did Captain Ren disclose to you the nature of the radioactive substance that was on the boat? And can you tell us? No. <sighs> we need to register for top what, secret what, clearance. What, what's your, what's your uh, uh, shameless speculation? I just watched Chernobyl, so I think it was he was given a Russian babushka that he had to take who had just lived in Chernobyl her whole life. <laughs> she was a radioactive grandma. She was just a radioactive grandma <laughs> that he was he was delivering because she had information. So and well the, hey, the Nigerians just couldn't wait to get their hands they, on her. They couldn't. They wanted he said they were bad cooks. So that's what that's what they ah, needed. They needed her twofer. to help. Yeah, there you go. Well, we we want to thank you guys so much for coming on the show. Um, tell our audience where it is that they can find the book. And uh, and how they can follow you guys if they want to continue to follow um, you know the things that are going on on your social medias and stuff. Um, you can follow us on Tattletown Publishing and Tattletown Books on Facebook and on Instagram, TattletownPublishing.com. I have an author page under my name, and Captain Thomas has a regular page under his name. 
You can find our book most easily on Amazon for ebook, although it's best booksellers worldwide, especially for ebook. Right on. And then Captain Thomas, where can we find you? Sydney, Illinois. <laughs> Bro, you don't mess with social media? This is- no, uh, uh, Facebook. All right. We'll make sure that the links to all of that stuff is in the show notes. We really appreciate y'all coming on the show. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for, thanks Thank for sharing you. your story. Uh, Ren freaking Thomas. Yeah. Dude, we, this, we need gotta to, be, we need this to has got to be the craziest story we've ever told. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's up there. I mean, I, I mean, I think, I think David, he's, I think, top, okay, I think top three, David Gant, David Gant, yep. $20 million. Yes. Roughly, stolen. Yep. In the stolen heist. Stolen by him. All right? by him. Singularly. And, yes. And then Ren Thomas, who's, probably him. Who's your other, and it's, I think, the craziest uh, story. Lynn Ulbricht. Yeah. Lynn yeah. Ulbricht yeah. might yeah. be, son, son might be the other imprisoned. one. Yeah. Two How times longer. Bizarre. Than El Chapo. Oh, extremely. I like, said I had to finish the thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's a- <laughs> hey, Camden. Um, Camden was pretty quiet during the pirate interview part as he was yeah. as he was just sitting back there. And, um, Absorbing. Yeah. Absorbing um, information. Yeah. As a good young uh, unpaid intern yeah, should. A- again, like, like, like we told, like I told them. Yes. Tell when, us. When we were talking on the phone, you said, hey, we got an, we got a potential interview. Mm hmm. And you said, I remember you played it out annoyingly too. Oh, for sure. Because you're like, just, just wait, just we wait had, for it. We've we had hit one of those walls where you were like, I don't think there's anybody interesting ever <laughs> that we could interview ever again. And then we get this email. You said, I've got one. Do you yeah. want to hear it? I was like, Yeah, sure. I don't think you're ready. Do you want to know? I said, Yeah. What is it? How about a guy that was that was taken hostage by pirates? Done. I was, I've. Yeah, I love it. I'm already in. I've, I've always wanted to talk to a guy. I'm. I'm so, and again, the characters in the yeah. book are fascinating. That there is literally a pirate with a peg leg. I mean, yeah, prosthetic leg, but sure. I don't know if that's if that's <laughs> nice to say or not, but it's, it's what it is. Well, we'll ask Nate. Yeah, we'll ask him. Yeah, we'll ask Nate. Yeah, and see see what Nate has to say. Let's see what he has to say. Yeah, because yeah, uh, I think Nate's leg is like the story. His leg is Bluetooth connected to his phone. Yeah. And like, give, he can put like no lie, he can put his leg in different modes, mm. like sprint mode, and <laughs> like I'm going for a nice jog. But he because he goes he surfing not. on the lake, and he puts his leg in surf mode, like he's a parshendi. <sighs> That's, That's a, a joke for like five people. Peg leg. Yep. So, uh, but, but yeah. I don't think uh, stories had that one. No. Characters are fascinating. The story is fascinating. We didn't we didn't get to this, but the first offer that the company made to get them out was twenty thousand dollars. And that in the book he talks about that that really made him mad. It made him mad? Yeah. So that they were talking initially, and he he mentions this, that they wanted two million uh Nigeria, which is the uh-huh. currency there, however you say I'm sure I'm butchering that. So you, if you I've got it up, hold on. Yeah, t- tell me in the comments how badly I said that. But the that was the currency that they they were originally talking about two million dollars of that, which is only like four grand. And so, like, if that's the if that's what they're anticipating that they're gonna get, like, who doesn't just write a ten thousand dollar check to get two people back? Well, well, he said he says also that three the million American 20, dollars is what they ended million, up with. Uh, at some point, they're talking about twenty million naira. naira yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is yeah, four grand. Yeah, uh, which is which is the he mentions is the cost of the food for a week of the company. That's that's the insane. cost of two two of the employees' lives. Was was that? And then they come back with so. I I didn't really want to get into this because it felt too personal. Yeah. Of the like. How do you how do you balance out like hey you know what my life to these people is only worth this much you know and then you've got this weird thing with him and Hilo being in different positions to the captors they're worth different amounts of money how does that affect your friendship if you've you've been captive with this guy for you know um, 17 days or something like that. And they're like, Hey, we're going to oh. give $2 million for you, but you're only they worth a million. Yeah. yeah. Like that's, that's weird. 
It is weird. I, I can also see the other side of, you know, uh, when it entering You're going to look at the pirate side, no, Alana? No, no, no. No, no, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, when entering into a negotiation of any kind, especially one over lives, you need to do it intentionally. Yeah. Uh, f- for sure. Which is, you know, it, when, uh, I'm trying to remember what that movie was called. Russell Crowe. Uh, Taken. Proof of Life. Oh, okay, yeah. Where that's his job, essentially, is is finding this person, but also extracting them, possibly with, with money, if that's what we need to do. But they it's, go into negotiation. He gives them a low number. They hang up, and he says, wait, wait, wait. Just hold on. This is part of it. It's Which, just... I, I'm basing all of this off of a movie, but... but well, still, but it's, it's but so... I understand there's a method to it. It's so crazy, but it's also wild to think that not only does, does Captain Run believe he was targeted... Mm-hmm. but it was obviously an inside job. Mm-hmm. He's working with crew members that are kind of forced upon, and he goes real in depth into this in the first few chapters of the book. And, and we didn't, we didn't have a lot of time with him, but we also didn't want to, to bog down with details, but these companies are forced to, while they can put their, um, like their command crew can all be people from the U S that, you know, are, are the captains of the ship and the, and the chief engineers and all of that stuff, the agreements that they have with the places that they're going for their oil is that the crew is actually locals that have been hired. And that's kind of the way that they get around, you know, then kind of with kind of the way that they get the rights to do this is like, Hey, we're bringing jobs to your area because you can hire another 19 guys that can go onto the boat. Well, those 19 guys, yeah, those 19 guys are getting paid pennies on the dollar for what a, uh, a crew in the U S would cost. And on top of that, it doesn't seem like they really recognize the authority of the captain there, because that's not really the way that we do things over here. If you want us to, to swab the poop deck today, like that's fine. But uh, tomorrow we we may not know where the bucket is, and he mentions in specific that like one day they would do something just wonderfully, like blow you out of the water with what a great job they could do, and then the next day they would simply tell you like, I don't know where that is, I don't know how to do that because they just didn't want to do it, mm-hmm. and it's so weird because you've you've got a crew of seventeen to nineteen people that know each other, that like each other, and that are, you know, this tiny little rebellion at any point in time that can rise up and mutiny, and the captain and his, you know, command crew are just kind of stuck. So many pirate words today. Yeah? Peg leg mutiny, scurvy, (laughs) pirate. Yeah, we did get to talk about Jolly Roger. Yep. Fascinating story, man. It's it's just totally crazy. Um, I think Lori did a great job of of putting it all together. one of the things that Tattletown Publishing uh, is is known for is telling stories of survivors. And why that's so um, important is not just to get those stories out there, but the reason that I think it's so cool is the way that they pair up these survivors with these really great writers. So that in the midst of them, you know, kind of processing everything and getting the details out, they also don't have the stress of trying to write on top of that. There's not a lot of people that can do that and do it well. Likewise, there are a lot of people that have their, you know, their co-author or their ghostwriter that gets no credit for anything that they do. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and one of the things that's cool about title town is that those two, you know, Lori and captain Wren, um, they come on these interviews together because while he had all the experience, she had a very particular job and, getting stuff from the family and talking to the authorities to figure Compiling out what exactly had on. Yeah. yeah. And then making sure that all of that gets put into, you know, a, a cohesive thing. Good grief. We can't even tell funny stories no. with any sort of chronology, let alone, you know, do, do this kind of thing. So she did a phenomenal job too. Um, we've got some other title town stories coming up in, in the next few months. We are actually going to talk to a guy who was um, partially swallowed by an 8,000 pound hippo. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to be talking about and telling the story of a lady who went missing for eight days um, and she was trapped upside down on her car on the side of the road. And now she's missing again. Mm-hmm. So loads of intrigue. Uh, we want to thank the folks at Title Town for hooking us up with it. Thanks for Lori um, for coming on the show. Captain Wren, thank you so much for being our guest and for telling your story, for making sure that people are educated about the danger that is literally on the high seas that these folks are facing day in and day out, as that's a big part about 
what he's doing these days. Uh, Dan, any closing thoughts? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. What about Abednego? Is how, it, do you, how do you say it? Rack, Shack, and Benny. I go with the VeggieTales pronunciation. Oh, okay. That's way better. That's it. Camden, you got anything for us, bud? No, sure. All right, fantastic. Thank you guys for watching The Reverend and The Rubber Bait. Y'all stay hard, keep jamming, and we'll see you whenever you're Captain ready. Lynn Thomas, and you should never listen to Reverend Reprobate. Hi there, Lori Van Gelder Preuss. I'm with Tattletown Publishing, and you should never listen to the Reverend and the Reprobate. Wow. That, that is pretty interesting. So over the radio transmission, they figured out you'd be a high value target. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> that happened. Shut up. Bless you. <laughs> there was no stopping that one. <laughs> well done.